All right, so I'm putting this video together and I want to start off with a standard disclaimer, which is that I might be making mistakes here. And I'm really intending to put together a tree that will corroborate as opposed to replace anything that you might have in your lecture notes. So basically everything that I do here should be perfectly um, consistent with what you have in your lecture notes. You might be using this to fill in some gaps. But if there are any glaring discrepancies between what you see here and what's in your lecture notes, you should probably get that clarified before you commit one way or the other. All right, so we're going to start off with a, uh, the tree just before we get to the metazoa. And it consists of the opisthocont portion of the tree of life. You've got the fungi. Uh, we talked about them in an earlier unit. The coanoflagellates, whose biology we just detailed in the very first day of this unit. And the metazoa, the actual animals, the animal clade, is the one that we're going to be featuring in this video. Or I'll change colors here. Now we're recognizing that one of the two major branches from the metazoa uh, leads to the periphera, the sponges. There are actually a few other phyla in there. Uh, these are the ones that are characterized by not having true tissues. And the other major clade is the eumetazoa, which basically includes everything besides the sponges, okay, including the uh, sea anemones as well as the turtles that eat the sea anemones. Now one of the major branches in the eumetazoa is the radiata, which includes the cnidaria, and you know, typically discussed as the uh, radially symmetrical diploblastic eumetazoans. And then you got the bilateria, which are the triploblastic bilaterally symmetrical things. Uh, these are the ones that have um, Hox genes. Uh, actually, they, all these animals have Hox genes in the sense they have homeodomain genes, but uh, in this case we're talking about those Hox cluster genes, which are important for anterior posterior positioning patterning. Now from the bilateria, we're going to be splitting into two major, major clades, two, two splits, one of which is going to be the deuterostomia. We'll talk about those after we get through the other group, which is the protostomia. And these are the two main kinds of bilaterians. Let's scroll over a little bit. And so the protostomia split into the lophotrochozoa and the ecdysozoa. And the lophotrochozoa are going to be the annelids, the mollusks, and the platyhelminthes, or flatworms, as well as a whole bunch of other phyla that we're not going to name. So those are the lophotrochozoans. The ectysozoans is a group that's going to include the nematoda, the roundworms, as well as the arthropods. So while I have this up, I might as well uh, remind you that we had some detail of the uh, groups within the mollusca and the arthropoda. The mollusks, we talked about the gastropods, the cephalopods, and the bivalvia, whereas in the arthropods, we talked about the um, crustacea and the Uniramia, as well as the Chelicerata. And those are the three main clades of living arthropods. And so on the deuterostome side of things, we had uh, two major phyla, phyla of animals, one of which was the Echinodermata, and we detailed them as well. We talked about the Ophiroidea. I don't think we talked too much about the Crinoidea, but we had discussions of asteroids. Those are the starfish echinoids. Those are the sea urchins and the sea cucumbers, which are the Holothoroidea. And then there's the Chordata. And this is the group that's going to be detailed in kind of like the second half of our tree here. This is the group that includes us. And within the Chordata, we had the Cephalochordates, which are the Amphioxus or the Branchiostoma slash lancelets. Those are the ones that based, that branched off most basally. And then we had another pretty basal branch, with the, which were the urochordates. Uh, urochordata include things like the sea squirts, as well as, the, uh, as well as a couple of other different types of urochordates. And then we get to the craniata. And the group that we discussed here, the group that we identified, were the hagfishes. Sometimes I refer to them as the mixini. And uh, by this logic, craniata, these hagfishes, aren't necessarily going to be vertebrates. The next stop on the chordate train is going to be the vertebrata. Now within the vertebrates, the earliest forms of vertebrates had no jaws, and these were the jawless fishes, the uh, heavily armored jawless fishes of the early Cambrian, as well as the uh, jawless fishes, the descendants from those uh, early vertebrates that we have today, including the lampreys. Now the other, the next major stop on the vertebrate train is going to be the nathostomata, which are the jaw-mouthed vertebrates. And uh, of the nathostomes that we talked about, we really identified three, uh, one of which were the extinct placoderms, and then we talked about the sharks and the rays, uh, those are the chondric, the ease, and then the third group were the teleostomi. 
Now the teleostomi are sometimes referred to as the osteichthyes. These are the ones that have true bone or endochondral bone. And within the teleostomi we recognize two major clades, one of which is the actinopterygii, and then we have the sarcopterygii, a couple of really fancy words, but they're pretty significant. Now the actinopterygii are the ray-finned fishes, and the ray-finned fishes are like the majority of all vertebrates on the planet. The sarcopterygii are the ones that we're included in. Uh, we kind of refer to them as lobe-finned fishes, and there are some sarcopterygians that are uh, legitimately lobe-finned fishes, in the sense they're still fish-like, they still live in the water. One of these is the coelacanth, uh, then you've got the lungfishes. Lungfishes are actually more closely related to us, so we can do it like this, lungfishes. And then you've got the tetrapods, the tetrapodomorpha, which basically means animals with four feet. These are the ones that transitioned onto dry land. Now among the tetrapodomorphs, the, uh, the one uh, group that is still basal, the most basal of the living tetrapodomorphs, would be the amphibians. And then the other group, the other lineage, is the amniota, and uh, that's the one we'll be featuring next. Amniotes, of course, are the ones that had that characteristic that allowed them to declare their independence from their watery past by virtue of their amniote egg. And the amniotes are kind of split between two groups, one of which is the lineage that gives rise to mammals. This is the synapsid lineage. And the synapsids ultimately give way to the therapsids we see in the early parts of the Mesozoic. And they eventually give way to the mammals, which have their first appearance in the late part of the Triassic. And we're going to be finishing up that part of the discussion at the Wild Animal Park. Now the other group of the amniotes is the Reptilomorpha, which is actually a pretty diverse group. It includes all the reptiles existing uh, today, as well as in the past, as well as the birds. And so to finish up our little tree, we're going to be detailing three major groups of reptilomorphs. Scroll over a little bit more. One of these reptilomorph groups is going to be the Lepidosauria. And Lepidosaurs include things like uh, modern lizards and snakes. This is a group, the group of reptiles we identify as the Squamata. Uh, but it also includes some other groups like the ichthyosaurs and the plesiosaurs and the pleosaurs that were aquatic reptilomorphs of, uh, of the Mesozoic. The second major group of reptilomorphs would be the chelonia, or the turtles. And we identified the side neck turtles of the pleurodeers and the, um, and the regular turtles and tortoises or the cryptodeers as the two main groups. Now the third major clade of the reptilomorpha are the archosauria which again is split into three major groups, one of which is going to be the pterosauria, which are the uh, powered flight capable archosaurs. They went extinct, but they're the ones that can, are capable of flying. Then you've got the crocodilia. Those are, that's pretty self-explanatory. And the third major clade, of course, is the dinosauria, which are the dinosaurs, of course. Uh, dinosaurs are split into two major lineages, one of which are the ornithischians, and the other group are the sauriscians. Uh, ornithischians are the uh, bird-hipped dinosaurs, which are largely the herbivorous types. Uh, very, very important. And the uh, Mesozoic and the Sauriscians are the ones that came in two varieties, one of which were the sauropods, those are the really long-necked ones, and the other group are the theropods, the bipedal, uh, mostly carnivorous guys. Now the theropods are, uh, are, are pretty famous. One of these uh, animals was the T-Rex, Tyrannosaurus rex, and the other uh, group, or, or one of the other groups of theropods were the nanoraptorids, of which one group became the birds. And there you have it. That's the entirety of the animal tree of life.